Here we are, uh, sub-period four. This is a period of educational reform. Uh, it incorporates the years 1880 through 1920. Uh, it has to do with standardization of both college and university uh, offerings and expectations. Uh, it has to do with the beginnings of vo vocational education in the curriculum. And it has to do with something called social efficiency, which is a movement that takes over almost all of society. It's a time in which the high school takes on its familiar characteristics. That Edward Krug called shaping. It's a time of criticism in general and reform in all areas of society. This is Teddy Roosevelt and the trust busters. This is reform, reform, reform. It's an era of populism and progressivism. And it's the age of the muckraker. Now, muckrakers were authors who wrote about quirks, injustices, uh, bad things about some aspect of society, like uh, Sinclair Lewis wrote about the meatpacking industry in his book, The Jungle. Well, educated muckraker, too. And his name was Joseph Mayer Rice. From January of 1892 until June of the same year, he took a tour of 36 American cities. And, in the, and on the tour, he visited American classrooms. He sat and observed teachers, observed administrators, observed the running of the school. In October 1892 through June of 1893, he wrote a series of articles in the Forum, which was a New York Monthly. And it was kind of like an expose of the, uh, of the schools. Uh, some people say his name became uh, almost a cuss word. <laughs> in educational cycles, as he, he wrote of perceived injustices and bad practices. Shift gears. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, three theory, theories of learning were in vogue at the time. And at this time, the theories of learning were not based upon experimentation. They were speculative. In other words, they were armchair sorts of thing. You, you sat back in your easy chair, lit up your pipe, uh, and kind of just waxed poetically uh, wherever your mind happened to take you. They were based upon assumptions about man's moral an actional character. I wish there was a better word than actional. A moral character, yes, we can understand that. Actional character, maybe the next slide will help. Uh, man was either, morally, man was either evil, good, or neutral. Actionally, and they could, should have put maybe heredity versus environment here. Uh, actionally, characteristics were inborn, that's active. They came from the environment, that's passive. Or there was an interaction between the environment and genetics, if you will, uh, to form an interactive actional character. Hopefully, uh, you get the picture. Mental discipline, and we've talked about this one. Mental discipline was 
the first of the theories of learning in folk. And it had two threads. Thread one said that man was neutral in terms of moral character and active, things were inborn in terms of actional character. Classicism, in other words, training the mind by mastering the knowledge of the ages, was the answer. You dealt with man's nature by teaching the classics, reading the great books. Thread two held that man was basically evil. And if left alone, he would grow up evil and active. That again means it's, it's inborn. Man is naturally evil. Faculty psychology, remember we talked about that, and Calvinism held that developing the faculties was the best means of controlling man's basically evil nature. So uh, we've got, in essence, mental discipline, uh, training the mind, either for the neutral active person or for the evil active person. The Yale Report of 1828 uh, was a defense of the status quo. This was a report that came out and defended Latin and Greek on the basis of uh, mental discipline. Defense of the status quo against which the visionaries flailed and failed mightily. This was published a year later in Benjamin Silliman's American Journal of Science and Arts. The linchpin was the theory of mental discipline. The classics give the best training. Whether it's neutral active, whether it's evil active, the classics give the best training. Moving on to the second theory of learning, uh, something called natural unfoldment, which has a good active uh, linchpin. Man is innately good, inheritees are inborn. The first one to profess this particular idea is a gentleman from the French Revolution known as Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, interestingly enough, Rousseau never raised his own children. He apprenticed them out, or some people say he sold them to others and had others raise them. Uh, Rousseau, <laughs> then, in the height of, gosh, I shouldn't have done this, wrote a book called Emile. Now, that's not Emily. That's not a girl's name. That's Emile, a boy's name. Uh, in which he's, he delineated the best ways to raise a young boy. The writings of Rousseau were picked up by Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi. We've alluded to Pestalozzi a little earlier. Uh, today we would have called Pestalozzi a nerd, or maybe the kids would call him retard. Uh, there was a much more intellectual group that went to school back in those days. And so uh, Johann's nickname with those kids was Henry Oddity of Foolsburg. <laughs> uh, I don't think we use that much today if we said Henry Oddity of Foolsburg. Uh, people wouldn't know what we were talking about. Remember, it was his object lesson that Edward Sheldon, Edward Sheldon brought back to Oswego Normal School. 
Pestalozzi's ideas were also picked up by Frederick. <laughs> I'm having a great time today. Frederick Frubble. Now, that's an umlaut over that O. I really should say Frubel. Uh, um, that's the way our French teacher taught us to do it. You you put your mouth like you're you're going to say O, and then you say E. <laughs> uh, I don't say that. I say Frubble like Barney Rubble. Frederick Frubble was a student of Pestalozzi who invented the kindergarten. Now, I've got it written there in its original German, and you can see why I don't pronounce it as such. Uh, he was the forerunner, if you will, of Maria Montessori. He was for educating the young in a structured curriculum, a structured environment. Uh, Frubble once said, uh, work, work is child's play. Or I have heard the phrase work is child's play used in conjunction uh, with trouble. Kids are just as serious about what they are doing as adults are about what they are doing. Moving on to the third. Uh, I kind of I kind of like this one. I, 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 if anything, I buy into this one in great amounts compared to some of the others. Uh, Apperception holds that man is basically neutral and passive. In other words, he, he's not good, he's not evil, but everything is determined by the environment. Uh, what happens to a person during his lifetime is most important. The theory stems from John Locke's tabula Rasa, that translates to blank slate. According to the theory, which is wrong, when a child is born, his mind is absolutely empty, blank. Now we know that's not true because babies have certain in instincts, fear of falling, sucking, etc. So, so there are things in the mind. But Locke held that when, when the senses admitted some kind of stimuli, like light, a vision of your mother, that that was recorded in the brain. And then the next sensation would be modified by the first sensation. And the third sensation would be modified by the, when I say modified, I mean interpreted in light of the first two, and on, and on, and on. So Aristotle was right. Was right. You are what you repeatedly do. You are what your experiences have led you to become. Now that makes sense to me. Locke's ideas were picked up by Johann Friedrich Herbart. His, his followers are known as Herbartians. I don't believe he's a Cajun. They would be Hebert then and Hebertians, and that's not right. Uh, we get the five-step lesson plan from the Herbartians, just about the same five-step lesson plan that you learned when you were getting your teacher preparation. That swept the United States in the 1880s, 1890s. Okay, those three now are in place until behaviorism rears its ugly head. I am, I am not a behaviorist. 